our first keynote speaker for the day, Mr. Peter Gelderhuis. Peter is a, um, a futurist, a, a technology entrepreneur. He's got an MBA in technology um, entrepreneurship. He, for interest's sake, is, is part of uh, a panel of five international members that is advising Vodafone um, on their new rebranding strategy and specifically looking at the trends that are shaping the future. Peter, may I please welcome you to your account. Thank you very much, Martin. Good morning to all of you. Um, and you might wonder why a keynote speaker on technology and the future opening up an agricultural conference. Well, what we're going to talk about today is not truly just about the world of agriculture, but how technology interweaves into this age-old uh, tradition or age-old industry. And what we are doing is unlocking opportunities that will happen next. So my journey today will be around the next five to ten years. What will happen in the world of agriculture? What could happen in the world of agriculture? Or as William Gibson said, the future already happened. It's just unequally distributed. So our journey today is not about what the future will look like, but rather what the future could look like. We're going to talk about some of the technologies that are going to shape our space, that's going to shape the world of agriculture, but also shape our personal lives. And the most important insight of all of this is that no one can truly predict the future. But out of the possibility of where the future could be heading, the question is, which of these technologies will you utilize in order to create the future? And that's what entrepreneurs and strategists do. They create the future out of the possibilities of today. Unfortunately, it would mean that some of these business units, business ideas, have to be reshaped around the possibilities of new technology. And that's going to be the concluding remarks towards the end of my presentation. So let me take you on a journey around some of the new technologies that can shape the world of agriculture for years to come. We're going to start looking at exploring the future and what these technologies can provide. And I had a conversation with Rob from USB and he said, Peter, what are you going to talk about? I said, well, I'm going to talk about matrix algebra, I'm going to talk about spectral analysis, I'm going to talk about narrowband IoT, LoRaWAN, and Ubers. And he said, I, I thought this was about agriculture. I said, it is. This is going to be a very interesting journey because in the next 10 years, we are going to transgress two very important ways. If we take a look at the work of Conrad F. and Schumpeter about six or seven decades ago, they've identified technology waves that drive the world. Yes, I know the world is very hung up on the fourth industrial revolution, but these technology waves have defined our society for years. And after each technolo technological innovation, we've seen the spring, the summer, the autumn and the winter of each of these technology waves. As they destroy jobs on the one hand, they open up opportunities on the other. The term creative destruction was coined by Schumpeter in the 1930s. And we are seeing exactly that happening in the fifth technology wave. So the first part of my conversation, I'm going to focus on the winter of the fifth wave. What does it mean? How will this interconnect to the world change the business models? How will it change the world of agriculture? And then, towards the end of the presentation, I'll touch on the beginning of the sixth wave, what we, what we can anticipate and what the new opportunities. So let's get started on our journey. What's really interesting about the winter of the fifth wave is defining farming. And more and more people are saying farming is like matrix algebra. Yes, you've got to take a look at all of these variables like the weather, and the moisture content of your soil, the nutrient levels, the impact of weeds, the impact of diseases, and your ability to react on them and the cost of reacting to them. And then finally, if you make this very difficult. Uh, some at the end of the day, get someone to help you with the equation, are you making profit at the end of the day? And that's the key objective of this algebra. And that's what farmers are doing. They're making an assessment based on what they need to do, what they need, or what they shouldn't do, and hopefully at the end of the day, maximize the profit. What we are seeing is that a number of new technologies and companies are getting involved in this. Firstly, accurately measuring the variables. Secondly, helping people process this matrix. And that's where the winter of the first technological revolution is taking us towards. 
where the world of IoT is allowing us to accurately measure the variables and also allow us by aggregating all of the data sets to help us process this metrics. So let's get started on this journey where we talk about how IoT can enable smart farming and help us with metrics algebra. There's a couple of key trends that are shaping this space. And the most important trend in linking the farm together, we have to start looking at the value chain. The value chain means the first component is all about the sensors. And this is what we're seeing. A dramatic drop in the cost of sensors. The soil, monitoring, uh, spectral analysis, all of these sensors are truly becoming really affordable for the entire world, not only for the industrialized sensors of agriculture. Um, we've seen these monitors and sensors being implemented all around the globe. And they are changing how farmers are looking at the world of agriculture. These primary inputs and variables are defining how they react to it. Now the sensors and the low cost of sensors are one thing. The other challenge is how do we connect these sensors together? And what we've seen over the last couple of years is a revolution in the internet of things. It's called low power wide area networks. And currently there are three main standards that are defining the space, namely Sigfox, LoRaWAN, and Narrowband IoT. The first two are non-standardized in the traditional telecommunication sense. The telecommunication companies are rolling out Narrowband IoT. But what it means is that as a farmer, <coughs> you can create your own network on your farm at a fraction of the cost of what it was a couple of years ago. And what LoRaWAN is doing is to enable sensors to speak to it by bursting a bit of information every now and again. The sensor actually wakes up, monitors what it needs to monitor, be it temperature, soil, moisture, transmit the data, and then shuts off again. There's some estimates that some of these sensors can last for 10 years. That's the battery part. I'll speak to that. And what we are seeing is that the information being transmitted, these small bits of information, can be, be interwoven onto a farm through a mesh network. The farmer can literally build their own network for a few thousand years. That's the reality of more land. Enabling you to have connectivity anywhere in the world. Well, the question is, can we connect those networks to the internet? That's another question, which I'll speak to briefly. But the cost of running your own network on a farm is really, really affordable, even in today's economic climate. We talked about battery life. What we are seeing is that these new sensors, or LoRaWAN, can last for more than 10 years. As these sensors only transmit data a couple of times a day. Um, the other key question is how do we connect all of these networks together? And that's going to be one of the key elements to understand that there are technologies that are reshaping the space. We all know about 4G technology. But what's interesting about 4G technology is that it utilizes low spectrum frequencies at 700 megahertz. What this means is that as the frequency goes lower, the reach is further. The higher frequencies at 2.1 gigahertz or 2.6 gigahertz, we use these in cities. They've got a range of about 5 to 10 kilometers. Those frequencies at about 700 megahertz can go or reach an excess of 80 kilometers. And with 4G being a very, very spectral efficient technology, we can connect communities together at a fraction of the cost of what was possible before. We are seeing more than 12 countries in Africa that have rolled out low frequency 4G networks. Somalia, Kenya, Angola, Tanzania. A number of them have rolled it out. Unfortunately, in South Africa, we still have a government that hasn't released these frequencies yet, and that is truly holding up the growth of the true IoT revolution in the world of agriculture. But another interesting technology is making the headways. Low Earth orbiting satellites. Here's the thing about satellites. If we take a look at communication satellites, they're geostationary. That means they're 36,000 kilometers away from us. We need a big satellite dish that takes us about two or three seconds for a ping packet to go there and back. But what if these satellites were only 80 kilometers away from us? The problem is we need about 5,000 of them because they will all be floating around the planet. And that's what LEO is all about. 
low Earth orbiting satellites. And there are three companies that are right now thinking about launching an internet cloud populated by NEO satellites. SpaceX, Boeing, some of the leading companies that are proposing the new internet connectivity that will cover the globe. And this will allow us to connect our sensors to the low power networks and connect that to the internet even if a cellular operator is close by. So the connectivity solution is very close to being solved in the next couple of years. What this means is that on a farm you can connect a variety of sensors together. This was a pilot project done in the Free State. Um, a couple of sensors were embedded in an uh, area that was focused mainly on, um, I think it was a uh, sugar, sugar farm. And you put a moisture sensor in the ground, and then you figure out what is the moisture content and when should you irrigate. So in most cases, we do it just in case. We do it once every now and again because we anticipate this is what uh, uh, what it, the sugar parts need for moisture. But if we put moisture measurement elements in the ground, we can find out if we need to irrigate or not. And this interesting pilot project, allowing you to look at dam levels, to look at moisture content all around the farm, enable this specific farmer to save approximately five hours a month of irrigation. And that equated to 400,000 rand saving per month for the specific farmer. As electricity price is price rising, it, it, it's enabling us to put sensors in the ground and make more accurate assessments around how we react to the information. So that's the whole thing around matrix algebra. Making decisions how we react on the needs of our farm based on information coming in. Utilizing sensors, low power, wide area networks, and internet connectors. This is the journey that most of the agricultural world uh, not already has embarked on, but will embark on in the next couple of years. So let's talk about advanced sensors. A couple of years ago, an Israeli company brought out this device called SIO. It's a spectrum analyzer. It's about as big as this little device I have in my hand. And what it does, it transmits a whole spectrum of light. And you, and you can take any piece of matter, any object, transfer <coughs> information directly from this device to your phone. And as it transmits its wireless signal, it gets all the information back <coughs> around the vibration of electrons within the matter itself. The absence of certain spectrum of light will then tell you what this matter is made up of. So I can, for example, scan this bottle of water and find out what other chemicals are within the water. I can scan an apple and find out what pesticides are. Well. I can scan uh, food and find out what the nutritional value of all of that is. This is what science can do. Imagine <coughs> the power of that information in the palm of your hand and the cost of this technology. We have it not. Take a look.
we are therefore seeing is an abundance of sensors that have been made available to farmers. The next step is to integrate all of that information into one database. And that's the key to unlocking additional value. If we, for example, put sensors in the ground and we can detect one generation, <coughs> we have sensors on our harvesters to find out what the yield is, we can then overlay certain soil measurements with the yield that we found in those areas. And then we can react accordingly based on the additional information being made available. So the sensors in their own right can unlock tremendous opportunities. But combining all of it is unlocking a huge amount of data and information for the farmer. And I'm not even talking about the entire value chain as farmers start collecting information. The most important element is that yield prediction is now possible by utilizing spectrum analyzers early in the year on a crop, we can make very accurate predictions around the yield. Combining that information just allows far better financial modeling around what the farmer requires, what possible yield uh, an entire country can provide in a certain complement. And this is what's happening around the world today, as each farmer is connecting all of the information to the internet, and as they are collect collecting the information, and gathering them and use databases. A huge opportunity is being unlocked in a world where information is everywhere and everyone has got access to it. The most important thing is that the entire value chain can be unlocked. Not only will data enrich the value proposition of the farmer, but enriched data will benefit the entire value chain. Think of sensors that can measure the temperature of certain produce and the retailer will have information of that entire value chain, although various parties were involved within the value chain. Think of pesticides and the pesticide monitoring through the entire value chain of devices like SIO, which I just explained. The entire value chain can be unlocked um, with specific niche market groups requiring specific products, and obtaining the trust that is linked to that data this becomes quite important, and that's where the blockchain is such an important technology. Now, farmer, farming and blockchain, whoa, these are two completely different concepts. And yet, the blockchain allows us to record information into a distributed database. And you can never change it. You can never delete it. You can alter the content later and say, I made a mistake, but then the trial around the change of the data could be verified. And what the blockchain does is to give an independent authentication of the data. So I can monitor temperature, and no one can alter that temperature measurement later. This means that the entire value chain becomes trusted, as farmers and all the other agents within the value chain connect their data to the blockchain, and through this, create a higher level of trust that whatever information I'm given is true to form and can be verified and authenticated by third parties. This is the beauty of technology and an increased level of trust using technology within the language. What's important is that technology is growing in leaps and bounds. And we also know specifically in South Africa that security and also access to information is critical for a farmer. So for the last 10 years, We've all been running around with these little devices in our pockets. In my classes, we call them Inco Puko Sucos, not smartphones. It's an internet connected, portable supercomputer, an Inco Puko Suco. The beauty behind it is this device is that I can download any application on it and read for its function. <coughs> Think of this device. How often do you make a telephone call in comparison to the times that you send email, search for information? Um, listen to music or even play games. And yet people refer to it as a phone. With that same logic, you can refer to your car as a cigarette light on wheels. <laughs> this is no longer a phone. It's a portable supercomputer that we have in our pockets, and it changed the world. This was the previous big thing. And for the last five years, people have come up to me and said, Peter, what's the next big thing? And in most cases, I couldn't give them an answer. Now, as a, as a futurist, you never stick your neck out, similar to a political analyst or economist. You never give out a definitive answer, but I never learned my lesson. 
So I'm going to try my hand at this. You know, I've seen it when the initial information comes in and they say, we're making a call, and this will be the next president. I'm going to make a call and talk about the next big thing. The next big thing will not be again. The next big thing will be invisible. The next big thing will be all around us. The next big thing will be the Uber. Okay, normally I get applause at this point in time. <laughs> Uber, the ubiquitous personal assistant. Because most of you have already heard of this wonderful piece of technology. But the Uber had a foundational change in October 2017. For the first time, machine learning recognized 95% of human words, which is better than the average human. And suddenly, the world changed. <coughs> Some of you have heard of Alexa. Introducing Echo Plus. It's everything you love about Echo, now with a built-in smart home hub. Echo Plus connects to Alexa to play music, make calls, control smart home devices, and more. And because Alexa is in the cloud, she's always getting smarter and adding new features. Echo Plus has room-filling speakers powered by Adobe and seven microphones that can hear you from any direction, even when music is playing. And now with its built-in smart home hub, Echo Plus lets you quickly set up and control your smart home. No need for a separate hub or app. Just say, Alexa, discover my devices. Starting discovery. And Echo Plus will instantly find and set up your compatible smart lights, locks, plugs, and more. I've discovered three devices. And just like that, you can use your voice to control your smart home devices. Alexa, turn off the living room light. Okay. With Echo Plus, you can ask Alexa to do simple things. Alexa, has been been how many steps I've taken? You have taken about 13,006 steps. <sighs> Alexa, turn on the fan. Okay. Or you can ask her to do multiple things all at once. Alexa, stop the weekend. Okay, here's your flash briefing. The weather, right now, it's 70 degrees with partly sunny skies. Today. And of course, Echo Plus helps you in all the same ways Echo can. Alexa, play my date night playlist. Your playlist date night. The Townsend's canceled the sleepover. <laughs> Alexa, what family movies are playing nearby? Family movies playing near you today. Alexa, what's on my calendar for tomorrow? Tomorrow there is one event. There's Teresa's birthday party at 2 p.m. Is that true? Is it your birthday? Yes, it is. This is with his Oh, is he? Oh, I should drop in on Dylan's bedroom. Come on, time to get up. Oh, just ten more minutes. Oh, Alexa, play my wake up playlist in Dylan's bedroom. Your playlist, wake up. Yeah. Alexa, let's go camping. Okay. The all-new Amazon Echo Plus with built-in smart home hub. The scariest part about that video is that the guy says, play my daytime playlist and nothing's playing. <laughs> that was really scary. What is fascinating about this technology is that it's literally going to be built into everything in the next couple of years. Into your cars, into your tractors, into your cameras, into your spectrum analyzers, into your fridges, into your ovens. Every single thing can either connect to Alexa or you can speak to it and it will be your primary interface to the internet will no longer be tapping on a phone. Traditionally, we had tapping on a keyboard, and this moved to tapping on a screen. Now, the primary interface into the internet... We're currently working with one of the minds to automate certain processes and to optimize the maintenance program. And this technology, which we anticipate to launch early next year, at a price point of about $800, uh, you can literally put that helmet on, look at the temperature sensors, and immediately it will show you which of these components are overheating. And you can literally replace them before they create uh, any larger problems. That's what we're seeing, how technology can enlighten us to see the hidden world. And that's part of this overlap between the internet and the real world. They call it the cybersphere, and it's finally here. I promise that 
I'll speak briefly about the sixth technological revolution and one of the key foundational technologies <coughs> that defines the sixth technology wave will be our focus on DNA analysis and DNA operation. On a very simple level, we have seen a huge increase in demand for microbes. Microbiomes have become a very important byword in utilizing nature's way of optimizing yield. Huge amount of research is currently being done in places like Europe with identifying which microbes can actually be utilized to increase yield in a natural way. So watch out for that specific trend. On a personal level, you can right now map your entire DNA yourself at a cost of about $120. Who've done their DNA mapping? Anyone that have done their DNA? 23andMe? So you go to a website called 23andMe, there's a person at the back. And what's interesting about it is there are two main trends that come out of analysis. There's ancestry and health advice. So I met my DNA about two years ago, and I came across some very interesting results. It looks as if I am a not German and French majority origin, but I have a British Irish heritage, a Scandinavian heritage, and then Italian and Iberian heritage. Um, I, I told this to my daughter that she's got Scandinavian blood in her. I wasn't there in the week, and uh, at some point she grabbed a chicken leg and started eating it like a barbarian. <laughs> and my mother in law said, Kelly, you can't eat like that. She said, I'm a Viking, this is how we eat. <laughs> I also have 3% Khoisan blood in me, um, and that is a very interesting indication that next time you get one of those forms that say race, I say mixed race, see attached form. <laughs> and what you'll realize as humans is that all of us are mixed race. That's the reality. There's only one race on the planet, and that's the human race. What is very important is how this DNA can detect or highlight certain deviations in the genome and identify exactly which areas you need to focus on. I'm going to share with you something quite personal. This is my DNA analysis, and I'm looking pretty good except for one very important deviation. The APOE4 allele. What does that mean? It means I stand a very high chance of getting Alzheimer's. Twelve times higher than my fellow human beings. And that really boils down to the fact that I, my DNA cuts protein in a different way than others. About 3% of the world population will have that, the APOE4 allele, where there's only one, about 12% of the world population. And the entire idea around epigenetics means that the food that you eat changes the way in which the proteins are cut within your body and how the DNA expresses itself. And this has got directly, or this is directly linked to your diet. So I need to figure out which type of things I can buy which is contributing to my health in the long term. I have to find out where I can buy A2 milk, Cassian A2 milk. No one in South Africa knows what Cassian A2 milk is. But a deeper research shows that your Cassian A1, this is the milk from all the European cows, I need to get A2 milk. In most other countries you can purchase it at three times the normal price. In South Africa you can't. This is a very important trend. Because certain foodstuffs I can eat, and this will allow me to lessen my chances of getting Alzheimer's. In the very near future, you can link your DNA profile to your online shopping list and automatically it will identify which foodstuffs will be optimal for your health. The interesting thing is, I'm, I need, I'm, not, I'm using coconut um, flour for my pizzas. I'm simply changing the foundational base of my diet and it's necessity if I want to recognize my kids in 20 years' time. <coughs> As the cost of DNA analysis keeps on dropping, and as more and more people will do their own DNA analysis, it will open up ideas around what diet it will be preferable for their specific DNA. And this will have an impact on farming and agriculture. As new opportunities start to emerge, and people realize that there are certain that demand for certain foodstuffs that is increasing, huge opportunities will be unlocked for farmers as we tie tightly into the need for a varied diet.
to optimize the health of the world's population. A brief insight into some of the predictions around the future. We also will see deviations in coffee beans as our climate is changing and we will by necessity will have to create strains that will be far more resistant to changes in climate. A brief insight into the world around us. I'm going to end off with a final overview. Right now, I can get a watch around my arm. This can monitor my heart rate. And the moment it monitors my heart rate and there's a deviation in my heart rate, the hospital can be notified. If they know that on my record I've got a certain heart disease, it will inform them that there's a great likelihood that I might get a heart attack within the next half hour. Within 10 minutes, the person will be in front of my door knocking on it and saying, okay, so come with us, you're going to get a heart attack in the next few minutes. And they either stop you getting a heart attack or you have the best possible hands if it happens. You see, in a world where information is connecting everything together, the entire value chain is changing. Everything in it changes as information is being abstracted. And this business model where you pay a monthly fee to stay alive is completely different to the one where you pay someone a lot of money after you get the heart attack. You see, in this domain, everything changes. The time, the actor, the location, and the constellation. This same mindset will also permeate the world of agriculture as information is now everywhere. And our knowledge of the environment will change as will our ability to leverage the value from within the knowledge. The future is here. The technology is around us. The only thing that is required for us is to grasp it and to utilize and leverage its possibilities. Thank you so much for your time.